we will discuss some of your questions. But right now, Professor Warnatz, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Martine. Um, and actually, this is not only um, IPOPI's first webinar, it's actually my first webinar, so I'm um, a bit nervous. Let's see how it goes. Um, obviously, I talk about my favorite subject, common variable immunodeficiency, which many of you know that is very close to my heart. And I will give you a personal overview what I think should be done for these patients and how we can help them. Um, these are my disclosures. First, I would like to start with the definition because that has been discussed many times and I think it is very important that we agree on what we talk about. So in 2015, um, several experts um, sat together and tried to um, redefine for the registry um, different forms of primary immunodeficiency and so we did for common variable immunodeficiency. And I think it was helpful, this exercise, and I would like you to go through each item with you briefly. So the first requirement was a clinical presentation. So it had to be um, patients who presented at least with one of the following criteria, either an increased susceptibility to bacterial infections, autoimmune manifestations, and these would be typically autoimmune cytopenias in our patients, granulomatous disease, which could affect any part of the body, but typically lymph nodes and lung, unexplained polyclonal lymphoproliferation, Many of these patients present with splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy, or there would be affected family members with antibody deficiency. As the second criteria, um, um, antibody deficiency had, was defined, and this was uh, conditio sine qua non. We were all only considering patients for CVID, which had a relevant reduction of IgG and IgA, and this was usually defined that there had to be two standard deviations below um, the mid of normal. And um, either or not, they could have also an additional reduction of IgM. That should be measured at two time points, but many of us um, are um, happy if you measured at one time point and it gave a clear result that we often don't repeat, except we have the suspicion that something else might interfere with antibody levels in these patients. And it is important to state that these had to be um, referred to the values adjusted for age. The third criteria was that at least one of the following um, should be also abnormal as well. And this was either the vaccine response, and typically we test them for a peptide and a non-peptide antigen, typically um, tetanus, and for the non-peptide we usually use um, polysaccharides um, from pneumococci um, to detect that. And Alternatively, and this is um, not agreed by everyone, um, but we suggested that alternative and um, reduced switched memory B cells would also suffice as one of these um, criteria. And this was due to the fact that often we see patients already on immunoglobulin replacement, so vaccine responses are not readily available. The next was that other four reasons for hypogammaglobulinemia had to be excluded, typically secondary, either um, to medical treatment or to lymphoma or to protein loss. But there are a few other reasons for developing hypogammaglobulinemia which need to be excluded. And usually we do not work them up for all of the differential diagnosis, but we try to um, especially um, exclude um, protein loss as well as lymphoma, um, as well as drug history, which would clearly suggest a secondary form of hypogammaglobulinemia. The diagnosis should not be given before the age of four. This is not because patients can't already present earlier, but this is because of the uncertainty of a diagnosis before that age due to the differential diagnosis of transitory um, hypogammaglobulinemia in children. And one of the new criteria which was also added, and um, I think rightly so, was that we need to separate um, CVID from um, combined immunodeficiencies where there's clear evidence of severe T cell defect. So let's first go into the clinical. CVID can present at any age. Um, we have patients who presented already during childhood, while most patients probably um, um, present during adolescent or young adulthood, but we have also some patients who present much later in age. Um, you can see that on this curve here taken from the um, publication from the AZ registry. Um, most patients, um, as I said, um, will present at that age, and this is where the clinical presentation um, becomes important to look more closely at. 
Um, because CVID um, has to be separated, it's in the landscape of primary immunodeficiencies where it needs to be separated from combined immunodeficiency, as I had mentioned already beforehand, and you see that in the red bubble at the top. But there are other forms of antibody deficiency on the right side, or hypogamma globulinemia of unknown origin at the left lower part of the slide, or secondary hypogamma, as I mentioned beforehand, on the upper right part of the slide. And this becomes even more complicated at the time when next generation sequencing becomes available to many of us. And we do find um, genetically um, underlying um, defects in, for example, LRBA or nf kappa B1, which most of the time need to be considered more likely to be combined immunodeficiencies or ICOS and CD19 deficiency, which most of the patients present more like with a CVID, like clinical phenotype or PR3 kinase delta gain of function mutations where they can either present with hypogamma of unknown origin or with a CVID-like compatible phenotype. What I try to um, explain by this slide is that in my eyes, um, CVID is a diagnosis based on clinic and laboratory. On top of that, you will have genetic diagnosis, which either fulfill the criteria, the clinical criteria for CVID or not, or they will fulfill criteria for another primary immunodeficiency. And so patients with nf kappa B1 deficiency can be combined or CVID, depending on their clinical and laboratory presentation. Now let me um, go on with a case report to illustrate some of the major features, how we in Freiburg approach our patients. Now this was um, at the time of presentation, a 25 year old male patient who had started his infection history with 16 years where actually it was regarded as a recurrent chronic sinusitis and not much attention was paid to that. Um, at the age of 20, however, he developed other signs. He developed autoimmunity as shown in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. He developed lymphoproliferation as in splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. He had um, interstitial lung disease, which you can see at the upper um, right picture um, of this um, CT scan of his lungs, where you can see interstitial changes compatible with what has been termed as granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease in these patients. These are important extra features which you need to um, evaluate at the very beginning of the disease already. And that's why we recommend in Freiburg to run CT scans in adult patients already at the very beginning to have a status quo before um, disease can go on. At that time, at 20 years, finally um, immunological workup was performed, diagnosis of hypogamma globulinemia, and then also common variable immunodeficiency was given after ruling out secondary forms of hypogamma globulinemia. An extensive histology was performed because a differential diagnosis of lymphoma was um, uh, thought about um, due to the lymphoproliferation in this patient, and it was ruled out and the diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency was given. Now, when you have a patient with common variable immunodeficiency, I think there are several ways you need to think about these patients. The one is on the clinical side. On the clinical side, I think there are two major groups which um, present as common variable immunodeficiency. The one group, which is on the right side, which um, are referred in the literature as infection-only CVID patients. These patients have chronic sinusitis, infectious bronchitis, they have pneumonia, they have infectious enteritis, and a few other infections. But they do not have what you see as a what is termed as complex form of CVID, they do not have signs of immune dysregulation, which can manifest as lymphoproliferation, the big red circle, because it's the most prominent and most common one. Splenomegaly in my hands is actually one of the clinical signs that you probably deal with a patient with complex form of CVID. But it can also be other organ manifestations like chronic enteropathy, liver disease, granulomatous disease, or the blue little circle you can see there, interstitial lung disease, or autoimmune phenomena like I mentioned before, autoimmune cytopenia. Now you can see that um, I drew these circles um, overlapping because in most patients, these are manifestations which you see several of them within the same patients. And what, a patient who has already one and classically autoimmune cytopenia is the first sign of immune dysregulation in many of these patients together with the splenomegaly. You will see further along the lines, you will see additional features popping up. And so you need to be more um, stringent with the follow-up of these patients to make sure that you don't miss these additional signs of immune dysregulation.
Now, if we look and what has been reported in the literature and what also is roughly our experience here in Freiburg is that we do see um, about, as I mentioned, 40% have um, patients have splenomegaly. Lymphoma is a severe secondary manifestation. I will not have time to go more into it, but we maybe want to discuss afterwards. We see that and owing the big cohorts in about 4% in the centers like in um, New York or in London or in Freiburg, um, we have higher incidences, but this is a referral bias of these. So I think overall the prevalence of lymphoma in CVID patients is roughly around 4%. Autoimmunity actually, and um, this is the study from the European cohort, um, has roughly 30% um, prevalence in the cohort of um, CBID, and autoimmune cytopenia makes half of them, um, as I said, very early onset. Granulomatous disease is consistent in many cohorts, 10%. However, there are regional differences in the prevalence of this manifestation. Interstitial lung disease, slightly higher, um, which is not always granulomatous. Enteropathy, I think, is hard to define and the workup I will I mention in a minute, um, but we need to be careful um, in what we call enteropathy, but uh, what I consider an autoimmune enteropathy, so an immune reaction against the gut, um, we find in about 10% and hepatopathy, especially with nodular regenerative hyperplasia, we find again in about 7% of our patients, which all need to be addressed in our workup. So how do we do that? So first for the primary diagnosis of CVID. Um, this obviously requires specific serum immunoglobulins and we recommend straightforward and um, quantitative serum immunoglobulins. Then we do test them for specific answers as what was mentioned in the diagnostic criteria. And I mentioned already that we usually use um, pneumococcal polysaccharides before and four weeks after vaccination if we can. And we do take a tetanus and titer in most of our patients. However, a persistent tetanus titer does not rule out CVID because it is amazing how persistent this response can be. Then there's obviously a differential blood count, but you need to do further workup. The small lymphocyte panel helps you to do the distinction to combined immunodeficiencies, especially in regard to the T cells, but also in some patients to possible forms of agammaglobulinemia with absent B cells. We love the extended B cell panel, as most of you know, and the reason we use it is actually to investigate um, switched memory um, B cells and 21 low B cells, and we can do that with a marker combination of five markers. If you have only four markers available, you will need to run two panels to evaluate both populations reasonably well, and I think they are informative in regard of the risk of developing um, the complex form as well as of the risk of having infections or also to vaccine responses. The extended T cell panel should include definitely the CD4 and especially among the CD4 cells, the naive CD4 cells classically characterized by the expression of CD45RA. And again, this will help you to distinguish patients with a higher risk of immune dysregulation. Functional assays we only run in cases where we suspect combined immunodeficiency with T cell proliferation. The other um, functional assays given here have been suggested, but they are very laborious and so not usually done in routine laboratories. Some are helpful, like especially in recently um, we have used more signaling studies, especially in regard to specific forms of um, genetic defects underlying a patient with a clinical presentation of common variable immunodeficiency. As I mentioned, genetics with next generation sequencing has become more important in us, and I will come back to that in a minute. And quality of life assessment. We just performed a study where we realized that we actually miss out a big and important um, diagnostic message if we do not perform quality of life assessment in our patients. And I highly recommend that you include that in your uh, follow up on your patients. Next generation sequencing has changed our look at CVID. CVID has always been regarded as a big black box with hardly any genetic defect in them. Um, then the first ones have been reported. They were very rare among them. But with next generation sequencing, we find more and more. Currently, we think about 25% of our patients show some monogenic defects, which we can characterize, and especially autosomal dominant forms, like you see the NF-kappa B1, the light blue at the bottom, or the purple on the left top with CTLF4 deficiency, become more and more prominent among these. And you want to characterize them, you want to discover them, so that you can actually address their need more specifically as you have done before. <clears throat> 
how is our workup for this? Lung, we do annual lung function tests, including CO diffusion. Initially, CT scan in patients where we see interstitial lung disease, we do follow-ups every three to four years. The rest is depending on what is available at your and um, institution, but I think there is additional information. The gastrointestinal workup includes stool cultures and um, when you have diarrhea, especially norovirus should be done, um, giardiasis should be ruled out, and typical bacterial infections. Gastroscopy, colonoscopy, fructose, lactose intolerance tests are added if you have a patient with severe um, diarrhea and you need to find out why that patient suffers from this and target therapy in these patients. Lymphoproliferation is still a headache. Um, yes, we do have um, blood markers, um, which might hint towards a malignancy in these. There's nothing working well. Um, we use these markers. Um, we do annual abdominal ultrasounds, and we do CT scans. We have used PET CT scans, and all of them are puzzle pieces, but none of them prove whether the patient has malignancy or not, and therefore um, biopsies need to be repeated in case you suspect um, that malignancy might be pre present in the patient. Similarly, liver, um, the main form of the ultrasound is um, of the liver involvement is a non-degenerative hyperplasia. Therefore, we do duplex and gastroscopy to rule out portal hypertension and biopsy of the liver to um, get better um, ideas. Now, once you have all your diagnostic parameters, including the um, severe forms of complications, you need to think how to treat your patient. So the baseline treatment is clearly the IgG replacement therapy. There are different application methods. You're aware of um, intravenous, subcutaneous, and facilitated subcutaneous. The dose um, should be, and the starting dose is usually 0.4 grams per kilogram body weight, which we apply every three to four weeks in patients on IV treatment, or 0.1 um, every week um, for subcutaneous. But we adjust it so that the aim of prevention infections can be achieved. The surrogate marker for that is that we reached IgG trough levels within the normal range. But this can be for the one patient um, mean that he needs um, a trough level of 10 grams per liter, while others are um, doing well with 7 grams per liter in the adult um, population. Side effects, um, you're aware of them, and I think I don't need to talk much about them. I'm happy to talk more about them during the um, question sections, and that's why um, I will not spend much time on that. In our patient, yes, he received IgG replacement and was successful. He had no major infections afterwards anymore. For the autoimmune hemolytic anemia, he was treated with high-dose immunoglobulins and steroids. And that was um, successfully treated at that time. But then at 22 years, he developed additionally another bout of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, but also autoimmune thrombocytopenia. He was treated the same way. He was not successfully treated for the autoimmune thrombocytopenia and therefore received thrombopoietin analogon treatment for a long period before we got to know this patient. At that time, um, he had the additional complication of a myelitis, which you can see here. Um, on the um, MRI scan, this is a white spot in the myelon, and he was treated with high-dose steroids. Temporarily, he um, su was successful treated. Actually, we could almost cure the um, thrombocytopenia. He had no more bouts of that, and this is now three years ago, after we treated him with rituximab, as you can see at the bottom, but the myelitis came back. So there are different forms of um, autoimmune manifestations, inflammatory manifestations, which might require different forms of treatment. And this is a major challenge, and I'm happy to discuss more of that. So the question is, do we know what the underlying genetic defect in our patient is? What is the specific pathogenesis of the secondary complication we want to treat? Which cells are involved, which receptors, which signaling pathways, and can we target these? And you see some examples on the left side um, where we can use hints from the genetic testing for a specific inhibition of certain pathways um, in these patients. Now, um, to come to a conclusion, um, common variable immunodeficiency is a diagnosis of very heterogeneous antibody deficiency disorders, which is, in my eyes, based on clinic and laboratory um, parameters. This diagnosis needs to be clearly separated from other forms, especially combined immunodeficiency. 25% of our patients do have monogenetic underlying defects, and they should be investigated, especially in patients with immune dysregulation. Clinically, patients can be divided in complex and infection-only patients. Immunologically, we divide them on the base cell phenotyping or the CD4 cell phenotyping. I mentioned the main populations important in this. Routine diagnostics need to take care of secondary complications in these patients. 
management decisions need to be based on all aspects, on diagnosis of um, clinical presentation, genetic diagnosis, as well as immunological parameters. But the leading one is definitely the clinical presentation on which we need to um, base our management decisions. Baseline therapy is IgG treatment. We need to get patients infection-free as much as we can. Several different routes can be used, and therefore in many countries we have the opportunity to um, choose individual preferences of the patient. And finally, the major challenge nowadays remains the immune dysregulation in these patients. And I think we're learning currently more and more about it so that we will be able to target, um, hopefully in the future, um, these um, complications better. For, our, for the sake of our patients. And with this, I would like to thank you um, for the attention for my very first webinar and to thank also my clinic group, which you can see on this picture. Thank you very much. And the first one I would like to, uh, like to, to ask is, uh, why are so many patients previously diagnosed with CVID being told they now have a primary dysregulation disorder, and what does it mean? Yeah, I, I didn't hear the very beginning of the question. If I understand that, that many of the patients with CVID have immune dysregulatory disorders, and what does it mean? They were previously diagnosed with CVID, and now they are told that they have this regulation disorder. Yeah, right. Okay, right. And and here I think um, the important um, message from my side is that I believe that uh, many, and in our hands it's ex actually two-thirds of the patients with CVID suffer from some kind of dysregulatory disorders. And some of them have underlying monogenetic defects like CTLA-4 deficiency. And then you have to be very careful whether you still call them um, CVID or whether they actually need to be termed something else. And in, in our hands, we still call them CVID as long as they fulfill the criteria, which I introduced in the very beginning, um, with the genetic underlying defect of CTLA-4 deficiency. And these are the patients which we call complex CVID. But that is a philosophical uh, fight. Um, I'm not sure who asked the question, and I'm sure there's a lot of agreement and disagreement on my interpretation of this. Thank you for your answer. Sure. Uh, another question is, if a person has a T uh, TACI gene, yeah. but no T cells, along with GLILT, would you still diagnose as CVID? Yeah. So if the patient has um, 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 interstitial lung disease, Genetically, the only um, variant was found in the, in the Tachi. Um, I would definitely still call the patient CVID and would um, also remark that there was a variant found in Tachi, which doesn't by itself explain um, the disease, but may contribute to the risk of developing the disease. Okay. Um, another one. What can I do if I have pseudomonada in lungs? Yeah, so that is a um, complication. We do not typically see an, an CVID um, patients. Um, we see it, however, when the CVID patients have ongoing disease and usually structural changes to the lung, which often involves bronchiectasis. And that um, gives a chance for pseudomonas um, to grow there. And this is actually um, a complication which we try to not see, but if it is seen there, then it needs to be clearly um, taken care of. And I think it needs the combination of um, infectious disease specialists, um, immunologists, as well as pulmonologists to get the optimal treatment to control for um, pseudomonas in these patients. Okay, thank you. Um, in case a parent is diagnosed with CBID, please explain the tests that his or her children should have. Yeah, right. So that's an important question. Obviously, if you are a parent, um, and or um, a child of a parent um, with the CVID. And um, the question comes up, um, what is about inheritance? So the inheritance obviously depends partly on the genetic um, underlying diagnosis. So if there is a genetic underlying diagnosis, it will depend on the pattern of how it is inherited. However, often in 75%, we do not find an underlying genetic diagnosis. And to these parents, we tell them that the um, risk um, that their child will have something like CVID is around 10%. That is from the statistics and from the large cohorts we see. Um, what do I recommend them? I re recommend them do not test the children 
unless there is clinical evidence or hints that um, there is something um, developing which could be uh, explained by CBID. This, however, changes um, if the family history is positive, and then I would be more sensitive to potential um, um, further workup, but that needs to be discussed individually, depending on, the, I guess, the attitude of the parent also, as well as the child um, on, the, on, this, uh, on this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. we, we spoke a lot about diagnosis. What would you advise for uh, follow-up for that kind of patient, especially adult patient? Yeah. Person, right. Yeah. No, I, I know. 50, I was given 15 minutes. I saw a Martine already yeah. popping up quite a while, and so it is hard to put everything in these 15 minutes. So follow up is essential, as I mentioned, and follow up needs to include in our hands um, that we get IgG trough levels. We recommend that IgG trough levels, once they are stable, we do every three to six months, so that they are um, shown that they are stable. Um, it includes um, a diary by the patient where he records an um, infection history because he will not be able to tell you how many infections he had and also how many antibiotic treatments he had and maybe if he has gut involvement, how many diarrhea, how many days with diarrhea he had. So the diarrhea, uh, the diary, sorry, the diary of the patient is very, very important to record these secondary complications. And then I mentioned um, some of the um, secondary complications which require additional follow-up. In distal lung disease, we do annual lung function, including um, CO diffusion, plus um, CT scan every three to four years, gut involvement. We do gastroscopy um, probably every three to four years, depending on the result. If you find atrophic gastritis, you would do every year gastroscopy because of the risk of secondary malignoma um, in these patients. And so it, it varies a bit on the um, additional complications there is. Okay, I think that we come to the end of this webinar. Um, I, I think it was great to have you with all those uh, explanations and this great overview. Of course, a lot of questions uh, need to be answered, but we will uh, proceed with that, don't worry. A big thank you, uh, Professor Warnatz, for your very interesting talk and for all the answers you already provided. Uh, thank you also for Dr. Niza Marawi uh, that also answered uh, in written. Uh, thanks again to all of you, and I could see that you came from the whole world uh, for attending this first uh, IPOPI webinar. Please note that you will be able to see this on IPOPI TV within a few days, and don't hesitate to share this video as much as you wish. You also can refer to the IPOPI leaflet on CVID, which has just um, uh, been launched and is freely available on IPOPI.org. And many thanks again to all, and see you in the next IPOPI webinar. More information on that coming on your way soon. Have a great day or night, depends where you are. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you again.